you went. <laughs> oh, you can hear that? <laughs> I can. <laughs> All right. Well, we are live on the channel. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the podcast here. Today, we've got a special guest. We've got Mr. John. Introduce yourself and uh, what you do over there at Trinov. Uh, my name is John Heron. Uh, I am managing director of uh, Trinov Audio Inc., which is effectively Trinov USA. Uh, Trinov Audio Inc. is a wholly owned subsidiary of the parent company in France, and we're responsible for distribution of the products throughout the Americas, North, Central, and South. Awesome. So recently, if most of you guys have been following the channel at all, I've uh, moved up to the Trinov Altitude 16 processor, which in my eyes, it's kind of like the Mount Everest of processors for surround sound. So I was very happy to get that in here. Um, but also, John, I I'm curious to know, what are the big differences? Like, why is there such a big price discrepancy between the Trinov products and, say, a flagship, say, Dead on Morantz? I don't want to name names, but we know who they are. Why is there such a big price yeah. discrepancy between the Trinov and the other, other bigger brands out there? Well, the... The sort of pat answer is that we do a lot of things that nobody else does. Um, and, and that's not dissing the Denons and Marantzes of the world because, you know, the 8805 for the amount of money that's involved, I, I think is a killer product. It's, you know, it, it's a huge value. Um, but the fact is we do a lot of things that you just can't do with an architecture of that type. And, and there are also, frankly, a lot of products out there with, very similar architectures that cost a lot more than the Denon and Marantz's of the world. And they don't necessarily do a lot more. They, they usually do some more. So I, to give you a specific example, um, we're probably best known for a handful of things, but one of them is the fact that we have a software-based architecture. So uh, rather than waiting for Texas Instruments or analog devices to come out with a new version of some DSP chip that they built for the mass market. Um, the way that works normally is that we'll use Dolby Atmos as the example. Dolby will give the golden code, uh, which is their definition of this is how Atmos is supposed to work. They'll hand that off to people who are known as implementors, which is distinct from integrators. Um, the implementors are companies like Cirrus Logic, Texas Instruments, uh, Analog Devices, and Trinoff. Um, those other companies, leaving aside Trinoff, um, their job is to build chips that they can sell a lot of because the first one costs a huge amount of money in R&D to, to, to develop. And after that, they can stamp them out at pretty cost effectively. But to recover the money, they have to sell billions, if not billions, but they have to sell a lot of these things. So by definition, it's a mass market kind of process. That's their business model. Um, by comparison, we take that same golden code from Dolby or DTS or Oral. Um, because they are scientists, they generally develop it on a Linux platform. Because we were founded by scientists, we also have a Linux platform called the Trinov OS. Um, it is a highly refined version of Linux that's been optimized for the kinds of things we do, audio. We, we don't, there aren't a lot of printer drivers or you know, any of that nonsense in mm -hmm. there. It's really focused on you know the kinds of stuff we do and as such it's relatively easy for us to port the original dolby atmos golden code in this example into our environment we don't have to first of all we don't have to wait for some chip company to spend a year and a half or two years developing the chip we don't then have to figure out how to in integrate that chip into a board of some sort that will work within the context of our product you know that whole process is called product integration you're integrating somebody else's chip into your product. Um, we skip that part entirely. And, and what it means, among other things, is that we're typically first to market, oftentimes by you know, 18 to 24 months, um, with the latest and greatest and you know, cool new things, because we're implementing it directly ourselves instead of waiting for a chip come. It also means that we don't have to put up with any of the, for want of a better word, any of the compromises that you know, some engineer in Texas makes based on his or her impression of what's good enough. So sticking with Atmos, for example, in late 2014, we were able to decode and render up to 32 unique channels of Dolby Atmos, 2014. 
Um, nobody can do that even now except for us. On the same uh, on the same unit, by the way. Yeah, yeah. The altitude, the original altitude thirty two came out toward the end of twenty fourteen. Uh, we had Atmos on it that fall. Um, we had Oro on it at ISC the following February 2015. Uh, DTS-X uh, we had running summer of 2017, if I remember right. Yep. Uh, and most recently, we now have DTS-X Pro, uh, which, just to make sure everybody understands among your viewers, DTS-X Pro is a different decoder. The encode process is exactly the same. So every DTS-X disk that you already own the, the difference is really one more of licensing than technology. Um, we were not allowed to render the available information to more than 11.1 channels by licensing agreement until fairly recently. And we worked very closely with DTS all of last year to you know put the finishing touches on D DTSX Pro and implement it and go through the certification process. Mm -hmm. But the main difference is that we can now take that same object-oriented data and render it to all 30.2 channels that were originally specified and available in the commercial, you know, commercial cinema version of DTSX. Uh, but now you can do it in your home. Uh, that was kind of a long-winded response, but but yeah, we were first on the market with the latest and coolest technologies with fewer compromises. We do everything at 64-bit floating point processing, which is insane accuracy, uh, whereas at best the DSP chips are using 32-bit floating point. Mm -hmm. um, we can do other things, like <clears throat> typically the, the DSP chip that's doing the decoding, right, that's taking the Atmos bit stream and turning it into X number of channels. Um, those chips all run at a set frequency. It's usually 48 kilohertz. Occasionally you'll see something with, that's running at 96. But anything else, anything that comes into the box that's not already at that frequency has to be sample rate converted to what the DSP chip is, you know, ready to do. So if you have, if you're just listening to Redbook CD, you, you have to do a fractional sample rate conversion from 44.1 to 48. And, and while a power of two sample rate conversion can be done pretty, pretty transparently, the fractional ones have a sound of their own, and we're trying to avoid that. So in the Altitude 16, as an example, if you play Redbook CD, we do all of our processing at 44,100 times per second. If you play a movie, those are almost always 48 kilohertz, so we operate at that frequency, 88 to 96. If you put 192 kilohertz in, we will downsample to 96, which again is a power of two, so you can do that pretty well. But even there, we're operating on you know, what we're trying to do is operate on the original data rather than a facsimile of the original data. And given the fact that, okay, most movies are 48, so running at 48's not too bad. But if you ever listen to music, chances are you're listening to other than 48. Mm -hmm. And we'd rather work on the original data. So that's what we do. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's let's dig into the um, let's dig into the OS a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So here we're on the main page here. So this is a little bit different than uh, what we see on regular like DSP based projectors, or projectors, <laughs> processors. Um, everything is done through your web UI, so we have direct mm -hmm. access to a ton of different setup options here. It's not all yeah. done through the web UI. There's no GUI. On the actual trend of itself so if you wanted to make changes and all that stuff in terms of like on screen display, on screen display things, yeah yes, so everything's through the web yeah. ui so there is yeah. no app you can't it must be connected to it uh, actually there is a trend off app you can get it uh, as in the download section of our website but the main thing the trend off app does is it it connects to the uh, you know makes a vnc connection to the unit um you know there is a you know to the degree that GUI means graphic user interface. There is a graphic user interface, and as you can see, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm imagining that you're showing your screen because yep. I can't see it here. Um, I do have a connection to your machine on the other screen, so if you if you all see me looking up, that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> um, but there is a rich graphic user interface, mm -hmm. but it is true that it's not, uh, it's not an overlay an on screen display. It's not an overlay on your TV. Well, and, and there's a pretty good reason for that is that you know we're we're audio. Uh, we're not video guys. Uh, we buy in the HDMI switching, and 
uh, we let the the video experts do what they do best and the uh, the best video guys would prefer to leave the video signal you know untouched uh, for you know, purest reasons you can think of this video file as, as opposed to audio file reasons and we're okay with that you know you can see our entire interface on a, an iPad, uh, your mm -hmm. iPhone in a pinch, although it gets pretty small, mm -hmm. uh, Prestron or, you know, any kind of, any number of different interfaces, uh, or on your laptop, which is you know, what I'm doing right now. And I'm doing it remotely. Can you, by the way, that's another thing we can do is provide remote support. Um, as long as I have the serial number to your unit, I can connect to any unit in the world as long as it's connected to our servers in Paris, meaning it's connected to the internet. Can you, uh, okay, so when you first, when you first get a, get an altitude, the first thing that you would do, I think you would drop, drop straight into the optimizer, right? Or into the uh, menu here? Well, so along, uh, um, can you see me moving my cursor? Is this, I, I don't know if that's visible on your Yeah, you can see it moving, yeah. Okay. Um, so along the top here, um, the, this, these little interlocking gears is our more advanced settings menu. Um, most people, frankly, don't have to go in there. Um, that's really for either power users or calibrators or people who just want to, you know, play with the toys. Um, the check mark interface is the play interface. That's what we're looking at now. Um, that check mark looks suspiciously like the V in the Trinov logo. Some things you do for your own amusement. Uh, this. 3D box here uh, is just a visual aid for telling the altitude what it has with. I've got you know this many speakers kind of at listener level. I've got these speakers above me, I've, the little brown ones that are depicted at the front of the room, but they're the subwoofers. Doesn't really matter where they are, so we just throw them at the front. Um, we have the space management interface, but the place where most people start is this last button here that is. Uh, like a cartoon version of our, I don't know if you can see that, a uh, cartoon version of our 3D microphone. Um, and the 3D microphone icon will take you to our setup wizard. And the idea here is somebody who's uh, never done any of this kind of stuff before, a real novice who's never seen any turn off gear, can come in, click that button, and then you know, if we wanted to start a new room configuration, click another button, and it'll walk you right through the process of, you know, do you want to override an existing preset or start something new? And we'll start something new because I don't want to wreck yours. And, you know, you give it a name of some sort, click next. And then it says, well, you know, what's your, what do I have to work with here? You know, and from the processor's point of view. And so you, you pull down this initial layout list and you have a number of mm -hmm. you know, different options and, you know, whether you want to be Atmos centric, Oro centric, DTS centric, uh, a hybrid of some sort, like you know, what we suggest down here at the Trinov, uh, and you pick something that's close to what you think you want to end up at and it'll populate the little three dimensional view. You can you know, move it around to make sure that, yep. Yeah, okay. That looks about right. Um, if I wanted to do a basic 7.1.6, let's say, I could start at 7.1.4. There we go. Um, you know, just as a normal user of regular, <laughs> regular pre-pros and receivers, this can look a little daunting at first, but once you use it the first couple of times, it, it starts making a lot more sense of what's actually going on. Yeah, so... This is, you know, this is the reason I wanted to come to this page is this is probably the most complicated thing in the entire process. Uh, everything else is really easy. And and a reason I wanted to show the Atmos layout is that this is all 24.1.10 loudspeakers that are provided for in the, the Atmos uh, standard. Mm -hmm. And you can now, if, you know, in addition to the basic 7.1.4 that I, I suspect most of your audience already knows, uh, you can add an additional speaker or speakers a couple of different ways. If you happen to know all of the Dolby nomenclature for all of those speakers, there is a drop-down list, which I use a lot because I've had to learn all that stuff. But you can also just click on a, a box here, you know, and you can move it around. 
So if I wanted to add the left and right top middle speakers, right? So that yellow one is, and it says up here, uh, so add. So LTM, there are two different things that can be called. Again, that's a get Dolby nomenclature. And then once you add the left top middle, it says, well, you can't have a left top middle unless you also have a right top middle. Is that OK? Yes, it is. And now I've got both. Um, and we can add subwoofers and things like that. But once you have the basic declaration of what speakers you have to work with, you can make that a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. And then down here, you have these five columns. You have Dolby Atmos, Legacy Dolby 5.1, 7.1. RO 3D, DTSX, and Legacy DTS 5.1 or 7.1. And each of these is basically saying, when I receive this kind of signal, what do you want me to do with it? And we will make uh, logical suggestions. But, you know, for example, if I give you, uh, let's take a look at the RO 3D you mentioned just before the call that you, you just got a bunch of RO disks. Yep. Um, Oro only has 13 main channels, right? Plus an LFE. Um, they don't have a left and right top middle. Um, they do, however, have the top, which some magazine writer called the, the voice of God, and that name stuck. Hmm. Um, and what you could do is to say, well, I want you to put the top channel into both the left, right, top middle and the right top middle. And that way it'll create a phantom image of a voice of God channel directly above you. People who are more sophisticated may say, ha ha, wait, that's going to be too loud because there are two speakers reproducing the sound instead of just one. Don't worry, we already take care of that for you. You don't have to think about it. We automatically adjust for any arrays that you decide to set up. But it's, it's really that simple. We'll make logical suggestions, and most of the time you just take us at, us, at our word, and it's fine. If you're a little bit more advanced and you know that, well, there is that voice of God and I'd like to play it back, you know, when I can, you can do this sort of thing. And then you move on and, you know, you can turn base management on or off and so forth. Um, I'm going to quit without saving anything. Mm -hmm. uh, notice that it is telling you, I don't think you had your microphone attached, no, it was, but it's it telling you that, uh, you know, the system is muted and the volume was set to minus 40 belts and suspenders we don't want any chance for feedback um, but so the setup wizard if you can follow basic instructions oh there one other thing about the setup wizard we didn't check it here but uh there's a little checkbox that, that says you know with or without help there's a contextual help system built into the setup menu which is like having the owner's manual just right there on the screen in front of you whenever you need it it tells you what you need to do at every step so it's pretty easy to set up, and yet there's a lot of depth there for the power users who want to go a little bit deeper. Can you uh, just touch real quick on the base management before you actually get into the measurement? Just just take a quick look at the uh, the base management, how that differs greatly from anything else that's out there right now. <laughs> just and this is and this um, is basic too. This is real basic as far as the altitude, but it's far more advanced if you were to look at it uh, in the eyes of like a receiver. Uh, base management setup. So again, if you if you want to just keep it simple because you know you don't do this for a living, all you have to do is you know choose on, and now it's on, and it will assume eighty hertz everywhere, mm -hmm. just like a basic AD. Would. Yep. And more often than not, that's not a bad decision. Um, after you take some measurements, and you can actually see how deep your main channels go and and how high your subwoofer can go and so forth. You, you may make a more informed decision as to, let's say for the sake of argument, your main, your screen channels can go down to 40 Hertz and then your surround channels are kind of medium sized. So they are good at 80, but maybe not much below that. And let's say your upper channels are, you know, only good to 120 Hertz because that's all it fits. You know, that's what fits in the ceiling. Um, just by turning it on, it was 80 hertz everywhere, and as long as you don't get carried away with yourself, it'll be fine. Um, if you were a power user and decided that you wanted, well, let me do it one, for one step at a time. 
Yep. So let's just say that we want to protect the top speakers because they're kind of wimpy. They can't do the deep bass, and we plan plan okay. to pay, you know, play pretty loud. So what we could do is just say, well, based on the specifications that came from, with those speakers, you know, the the specification sheet, I'm going to set this up for 120 hertz instead of 80, and then so check. I'm going to drag this down a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. And so now I'm going to say, I want you to apply that only to my upper channels, and that one there. And now where does that extra base go? Well, in this case, we only have the one sub-channel. Hit apply. Then you're done. All of the other speakers are still at 80 hertz. Yep. But we just changed the ones that we checked off to 120 to be on the safe side because they're little speakers up in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And without getting into it in too much more detail, uh, I mean, you can confirm this by coming on to individual setup. And you can see that the left channel is still at 80. And if I pull this little list down, oops, pull this little list down, go to one of the top channels. And oh, did I not? Hit save. I did that save. Oh, dope. Um, yeah. Okay. So I forgot to hit the apply button. Let's do it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you can change it to 120 for those. If you wanted to, we have this thing called intermediate bass management, which, to my knowledge, nobody else does. Let's take that same situation where you have the left top front speaker that's kind of small, doesn't do bass. If you were to redirect, uh, all of the bass from up there to the subwoofer that maybe is in the left right corner of the floor uh, at 120 hertz some people will detect that be able to localize that sound and so that plane that was supposed to be flying overhead part of the plane sounds like it's coming from the floor and it well that's just wrong um, now you could put it back in the ceiling but you probably overdrive the speaker there's got to be some other solution in our case you can redirect everything below 120 not only to another subwoofer, but also to another speaker. So in this case, maybe you take the left top front information below 120, redirect it to the left main screen channel, mm -hmm. which can do that very easily. And then if the left main screen channel is good down to about 40, maybe you redirect everything below 40 from that speaker into the sub, which would include anything that was below 40 that was originally intended for the ceiling. So you can move the sound only as far as it has to move in order to be reproduced, uh, rather than just automatically sending it to the sub where you might not want it to be. Yeah, that's that's impressive. That's an impressive thing. I've been doing. I've been messing around with having my base for my my front channels, my front sound stage. Just go to the front speakers, and maybe, and then directing the others to the other speakers to the other subs rather. Um, and that's something. That's the kind of flexibility that you get with this software that I haven't come across with the more mainstream brands out there. Yeah, there's a speaker company um, whose founder I know quite well. And uh, although this is somewhat controversial, he is a big believer in what he calls directional base management and what I call sort of regional base management. Um, people who very low frequencies are not particularly directional. You know, even at 80 hertz, the sound wave is about 14 feet long. and we only have about six inches between our ears, so we can't really triangulate on it. Um, however, Paul, my friend, um, is of the opinion, and he's demonstrated for this for me, and it, it, it can be persuasive. Um, it has some limitations too, but it's, it's quite persuasive. He wants to redirect, let's say you have four subs, one in each corner of the room. He wants to redirect the base uh, only to the nearest sub. So the left top front, the left speaker, and maybe the left wide, would all go to the front left corner sub and likewise all the way around the room. Um, now, if you do this, you need to have bigger subs because depending on what's happening in the soundtrack, the deep bass might only be reproduced by one sub instead of all four helping each other, right? So that's one of the limitations. He doesn't have a problem with big subs. He likes selling those. Um, but his perspective is that, you know, if there's an explosion, like the opening scene from Unbroken, uh, is what he demonstrated for me. There, there's flack going on all around you. They're dropping bombs. And some of the concussion, like at one point there's this 
uh, flak burst that happens really off to the left of the plane. And, and you can feel it. I'm not sure that you're hearing the bass coming from that direction, but there is this sense of the concussion coming from kind of over there. And he feels that that adds a lot of realism to, you know, if it was an actual explosion coming from over there, there would be this concussive wave that would pass through you. Um, and it's pretty persuasive. Um, it's not for everybody, but it's one way of doing things. And we can do that very easily. Uh, if you have more than one sub, you just say, send this here, send that there. No problem. Speaking of uh, subwoofer base management, so the the altitude measures each subwoofer individually, or does it sum it all together and measure it as one? Either or both. Either or both. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, I warned you that this, this could be, this one section yeah. could be really Let's long. get into it. Um, and, and, and for your audience, we have a whole bunch of webinars, and uh, we're doing an introduction to base management in a couple of weeks, I think. I don't remember exactly when. Uh, we will follow that up with a much more advanced uh, base management, base alignment kind of thing um, that's more of a master's class at a, a future date. Um, but this is, a, this is a pretty big area of discussion. Um, in broad strokes, there are several schools of thought, but let's take as uh, two extreme examples. The one that I just described, where you want bass only to be reproduced coming from kind of the part of the room where it's coming from. Um, and then there's another approach to aligning bass that is saying we want to minimize the seat to seat variation throughout the listening area. That's more important to us so that everybody has, you know, as much the same experience as possible. And the way you do that, to oversimplify a bit, is to set things up so that, you know, we all have had the experience of, you know, you have a single subwoofer in the room, and if you put on a single sine wave and walk around the room, there are parts of the room where it's really loud and parts of the room where you don't hear anything at all. It's, it's a dramatic, you know, you don't hear that with program material so much because it's not just one sine wave at a time, but it's still happening, and it gives people a different experience. So the idea of the second approach is to say, well, at any, in any given chair, one subwoofer might be strong, you know, might have a peak, another subwoofer might have a valley. Can we set this up so that the hills and valleys of one sub offset the valleys and hills of another sub? And Floyd Tool and Sean Olive did a lot of research on this, and kind of the sweet spot is four subs. Two is definitely better than one, big mm -hmm. difference. Um, and, and four gives you about 98% of what's available. You can go more than that. There's nothing wrong with going more than that, but uh, you get into diminishing returns. Um, but even doing the four requires that you set it up correctly. And this is where uh, I'm going to try and oversimplify a little bit. Um, two different ways of doing it would be to set up four different subs, have the optimizer individually calibrate each sub and set level and de uh, level and delay and all the equalization and and then just assume that when, once every sub is optimized that they'll all work beautifully together and then there's another school of thought that says yeah that's a really big assumption um so let's instead set up the four subs and set level and delay however your school of thought thinks it should be set uh and then even though there are four subs we're going to optimize them as though they were a single sub and so uh, more sophisticated base alignment technique. The way we do it is, oh, you're going to show us. Yeah, let's see, let's take a quick look at it real quick. Uh, you're ahead of me. Uh, if you go to active crossovers, well, actually, I'm going to have to change one thing because I used up all 16 outputs. Uh, so let me, oh, okay, so we're on your, we're back to your system now. That's right. And let me just double check and make sure. Wow, the internet is really slow. It hasn't told me yet what the preset we're on. Oh, I don't think we're on anything. Hold on. Oh, we're still on. Okay. We're still on the test one that I started to make. Uh, okay, so let's fix that. Gosh, this is... Oh, we're going to be... Uh... I apologize, folks. I've been having a slow internet connection all day. And we're going to be stuck here. I don't know why. Yeah, that's right. There we go. Okay, so now it's... Could also... Are, are you clicking as oh, well? Oh, yeah, I was trying to get back. Okay, we, we might both be trying to drive the same bus. 
Um, Should I try to log out, come back in? No, just uh, I think just stop clicking so that well, maybe I need to log out and log back in because it's I can see the back to the main screen button mm -hmm. flipping. But okay, let me let me do that. I'll log back in because we can connect any of our units anywhere in the world, but that doesn't mean that the internet does it quickly. Yeah, there's there's nothing there's nothing selected on my end. Okay. Let me uh, let me see. Click off that. Just I, I'm back in. Okay. If you wanna, or you can do it. Just go back to the main interface, the check mark interface. Yeah, I can't. See. We can show somebody uh, another technical feature we're doing. I can't. I can't even select anything. Huh. Technical difficulty here. Yeah. Let's, well, that's uh, disturbing. I just disconnected again in case that helps. Well, let's talk about the. So, uh, let, let me get this working while you talk about. Let's talk about the actually the base setup. I know how advanced the Trino software is. Well, I can finish the thought that we were going to try to illustrate. Yeah. What you can do is to create, declare a single subwoofer output. And then you basically fib to the altitude and say, oh, by the way, this is a quad amplified subwoofer because we have active crossovers. We can do active, bi-amp, tri-amp, quad-amp. Um, and when you quad amplify the subwoofer, you then have the option of manually setting the level and delay values uh, very accurately to get them exactly where you want them for the four subs that are maybe in the four corners of the room. But then when you go back to the optimizer, it sees all four of those things as a single channel and it will optimize them as a group. So regional base management, individual optimizer base management, uh, sort of a summed base, you know, multiple subs, but treat them as one approach. Those are the main categories. And, uh, you know, different calibrators will have different ideas as to why they think the best one, you know, which one is best. Uh, some of those ideas are based on better science than others, but the fact is we support all of them. Um, so it's really yeah. what you want to do. This is well beyond, you know, the the novice user. This is typically for somebody who's hiring somebody to come in and do stuff that they don't understand themselves how to do. So yeah, just give you a, a quick little reboot there because it was frozen. Oh. But speaking of uh, speaking of the base management, though, <clears throat> now, I know a lot of guys like to use like Room EQ Wizard, and actually, no, it's back up. Take take, let's take a quick peek. Yep, I just saw it pop back. Okay, back. let me log back in. Okay. So yeah, we're gonna take a quick look at the graphs here after you run a measurement. Okay. So is this um, the preset you want to be on? Yeah, that's one. I, that's one I've been using. Okay. Okay. Um, so you wanted, oh, I'm sorry, you wanted to look at the graph. So that's under the gears menu, the advanced settings menu. Um, all of the menus except for this one, this multi-tabbed interface, are actually written in HTML5. So if you have a web browser, you can do all of that other stuff. Um, this part of the menu system both because it's a little bit more advanced therefore you know the, the default settings are what 95 percent of the people want and need um but you know you can come here and, and do kind of power user stuff um and also this is just an older part of our software and we'll reinvent it in html5 someday but we're not done with that yet um but if you take a look at the optimizer graphs since you mentioned that um, we have guys this isn't perfect measurements for my subwoofers all right just just just, just in case you're looking it's not bad um, so it's a fairly flexible system as you can tell uh, we can change you know right now we're just looking at the before and after curves you can also see uh, filter let's see Back. Yep. Okay. 
So I I know we were talking about my sixty hertz dip. There is one subwoofer. Mm -hmm. There's one subwoofer I changed locations, and I was able to give her yeah. that sixty hertz, the red one subwoofer yeah, four. It's much better than yeah. it was. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Um, and that's you know one of the things that you can see very easily. You, this interface is a little bit complicated, so I apologize to your your viewers. This is the sort of thing that most people don't have to get into. However. Uh, this is measurement point number one. You know, this is a different chair uh, in the theater somewhere, measurement point number two, and a third measurement point. Um, and you can see that in different parts of the room, different things are going on. One of the things that the optimizer does that, again, there may be somebody else who does this, but I'm not aware of anybody who does it in as straightforward a way as we do. When you're doing these multiple measurements, you get to decide exactly how important the various measurements are. So if, and you can rename them, if measurement one is, you know, the second row middle seat, you can call it second row center or whatever. Uh, or you can just call it MLP for main listening position. But if you want the main listening position to be, uh, I don't know, 10 times more important than the others because you're just watching a movie by yourself that night, um, you just assign it a value of 10, leave the others at one, have it recompute things and you're there you save it in a preset and then maybe you have a different preset that is for you know family and friends night or the super bowl or whatever where you kind of spread the correction more evenly around the listening area um and so you just put in numbers of you know uh, you know these seats are all equally valued you know, you know one 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 we'll do the arithmetic to make it add up um but you get to tell us based on how you want to use your system, what are the most important chairs? And how do you want us to factor them into the correction? And the little check mark is the reference button, like your reference seat. Yeah, the, the reference uh, seat is the one that is used for three things. Uh, level, determining the proper levels, determining the proper delays, uh, and then uh, remapping, which is another one of our technologies that uh, we might want to touch on. Um, but uh, just briefly, remapping is gross oversimplification, but it, you know, we've all experienced stereo where there's a, a vocalist who's hanging halfway between the speakers and can be quite realistic and there's no speaker there, but by gosh, it sounds like there's somebody singing halfway between the speakers. Take that same idea and understand that, okay, we, we have this odd three-dimensional microphone. There, there are four mic capsules here in a very specific tetrahedral or a specific geometric arrangement to one another. And the idea is you orient this thing so that it's, if you will, aimed at this way. It's rotated so that that's front and center. And then when we play a test signal from, say, the left speaker, as the sound waves pass through this array of four microphone capsules, based on the different arrival times to each of the capsules, we can triangulate to within two degrees of azimuth or the points of the compass, two degrees of elevation, and one centimeter of distance. And we can figure out pretty precisely where that speaker actually is. We repeat that process for all of the speakers. We build a three-dimensional map of your particular room and exactly where the speakers are relative to that reference position, right? And that's where remapping comes in. We have a three-dimensional map of your theater we also are decoding the Dolby Atmos DTSX, whatever it might be. So at any moment in time, if there's a sound that's supposed to be coming from a very particular direction, you know, we know where the sound is supposed to be coming from. Unlike other people, we also know where your speakers actually are. So we can translate from the theory of the soundtrack to the reality of your particular theater. And that's what remapping is all about. We're remapping from soundtrack to reality so that's, that's um, so that's why and it's like stereo imaging but on steroids and in 3d so that's why your microphone here i'm, I'm holding up the microphone right now that's why your microphone has okay. actually four four little capsules on there four mic ends so you, you're measuring in three-dimensional space as a as opposed to other measurement um microphones which it's just one this one has four right the only thing you you can get two dimensions with a single microphone capsule, you know, how loud is it and how long did it take to get here? And I'm including frequency response and how long, how loud is it? How loud is, is it at different frequencies? 
person, but you have no idea where the sound came from. You just know how long it took to get here, right? Because if it's a the speaker's very far away, it'll take longer. Um, with a microphone like this, we're actually measuring a complex three-dimensional sound field. Um, you know, what's happening in your room at that point in space. And that gets back to the name of the company. Uh, it is a French company. It sounds Russian, Trinov. Um, Trinov actually stands, for, it's a, derived from tri, like triangle, triple, the prefix for the number three, uh, and innovation. And so back in, well, the company was incorporated in 2003, but back in 2000, when the founders started working together on the, the basic research, um, the name of the company that they had imagined was Trinov Audio or Innovation in 3D Sound. Because what they set out to do, and originally they were doing basic research, like you would normally see it in a university, um, they wanted to explore how to capture, store, and as needed process, and then subsequently recreate complex three-dimensional sound fields in a really convincing way. And there had been a little bit of work kind of done around the edges of that, the, the oldest of which was Michael Gerzen and Ambisonics back in 78. There were a couple of studies at University of Delft and wave field synthesis. And, but all of the things that had been done, it was mostly academic research, and none of it had really been translated into real-world products, very little. Um, but also, it was all just kind of picking it around the edges, and they wanted to be much more ambitious and you know see if they can't capture it, define it, and then recreate a convincing semblance of it in a different acoustic space. Uh, one of the first things they found was that, uh, and we actually have it in our training, we have a photograph of our uh, this, our current CEO, one, one of the founders, Arno Labery, uh, sitting in uh, what was his grandmother's apartment uh, across, more or less across the street from Versailles. Um, he took this fairly large room in her apartment, and there was uh, a circle of uh, 12 speakers kind of at listener level, another circle of 12 speakers up above him hanging from the ceiling. And this was their basic research lab for what they were doing. And even though all 24 of these speakers were identical, um, they discovered that the the sound field was not as seamless as they wanted. It was pretty, pretty capable, but not seamless. And they quickly discovered that even though the speakers were identical, there are, of course, parts tolerances, but more importantly, the speakers are in different parts of the room, and the room was loading them differently, making them behave differently. And they discovered quickly that, well, what we need first before we can really do a lot of this work is something that will optimize the performance of both the speaker and the room to a degree where all of the speakers are working together rather than working against each other in some ways. Uh, and what became the speaker room optimizer, which is our proprietary, uh, for want of a better term, room correction system, um, actually fell out of that desire to do better three-dimensional work back in the early 2000s. Um, it became the reason why we're a commercial company today instead of just a pure research company. Um, initially, the optimizer technology was sold into recording studios and post-production houses, uh, OB vans, which are those little trucks that are outside of sports stadiums that do the live mixing, the live events and such. They're tiny little trucks. There's just no way to get good acoustics into such a tiny little space, but they need to be able to hear what is going on so they can do a good broadcast. Um, so that was our original market. It was, it was all pro. Uh, then we evolved into commercial cinema and then into sort of the, the higher-end residential stuff. Mm-hmm. Can we can we take a quick look at the um, the graphs again and and how does the optimizer optimize sound? Looks like I need to refresh my <clears throat> connection. Or are you? Uh, is this not working? No, no friends. I, I my connection to the internet has been a little odd, off and on all day, and it appears to have flaked out. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I can see it at the moment. I, I, but you tell me what you're looking at, and I can tell you. <laughs> uh, we're back on the uh, on the optimizer graphs right now. 
Mm -hmm. I'm showing the subwoofers, but I will. So, guys, these are just the subwoofers here. This is the response that I'm getting in the subwoofers. And then you can select the response that you want to see here. So, as you can see, S1, 2, S3, S4. Those are subwoofer 1, 2, 3, 4. But you can click on those little buttons here on the, uh, the right-hand side. So, left is left channel. R is right channel. So on and so forth. And um, this is the before. So, that's before. You know, it looks like a mess. This is after the graph below. And then now we're looking at filter, which is on the bottom. So what are we looking at here? And how how does the optimizer affect what we're looking at here? So I should probably finish one detail on the microphone. Uh, all four of those little caps are calibrated within a tenth of a dB from 20 hertz to 24 kilohertz. So it's they're extremely accurate with the calibration file. Um, you also notice if you can see them, I don't know how visible that is where you are. Uh, they're pretty tiny. Um, they're a little less than a quarter of an inch across. And that's actually important because if you have some of the half inch capsules like the, the U mic and you know, some of the other popular mics, they actually come with two different calibration files. Uh, one for zero degrees or coming straight into the microphone and one for what's called a grazing incidence or 90 degrees going across the face of the microphone capsule. What that means is that the reason why you need two is that when you're going across the face of the microphone capsule, there's a certain amount of averaging when this, the sound waves get very small. And so the, the high frequency response is just not very good um, when you're coming across the capsule instead of going straight with. And so you have to have two different calibration files to correct for that. Um, the problem is when you're doing immer Looks like we lost John here. Looks like we lost him. All right, hold on. Let me try to call the man back and see if we can get him back on here. Poor network connection. Technical difficulties here, guys. Unfortunate. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Well, well, what? We'll, uh, we'll hang out a few minutes to see if he can get his uh, connection situated there. I'm not even sure if we are actually still alive. Is everything working in your guys' end over there? Can the optimizer also time align multiple subwoofers, or does it just work on frequency response? Well, we'll uh, we'll ask him. <laughs> we'll ask him once he gets back on if he can get back on. But what we are looking at here, what we're looking at here, as I was talking about earlier, is that after you run your your measurements, you know, the first box here is the what it's measuring in your room. Second box is the is the correction that it applies. Oh, 
Oh, so I can so come again. Hold on, here we go. All right. Can you hear me now. I think we're back. Okay. All right, we're back. Uh, I uh, I was hearing you just fine when you said you know I think we lost him. Uh, so I while uh, since I tried calling you and it didn't work, I, I rebooted my machine. Sorry okay. about that. <laughs> we're good. It's all good. It happens. All right. What were we talking about? Cheeseburgers? No. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> we were talking about the capsules on the mic. Yeah. So um, the fact that our capsules are very small means that at you'd have to go to a very tiny frequ- uh, wavelength, very, very high frequency, before you would run into that calibration problem. The problem with the larger half-inch capsules is that uh, if you are set up so that you can measure the screen channels correctly, then you will be measuring much more high frequency energy coming from above you than is really coming at you. And automated EQ systems will then make the high, the, the upper channels uh, much softer in the highs than is accurate. Um, I'm not quite sure how people are getting around this with some of the other systems, um, but I we I discovered this problem the hard way gosh, five or six years ago when I was at a different company. Uh, it was before Trinov. And I was I was very happy to see the small capsules that Trinov uses when I, I joined Trinov in January of 2016. How, how good are those? Um... Oh, you are there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You had me worried there. <laughs> <laughs> and, those, and those mics, those mics, when we're doing subwoofer calibration should we do that prior like how good is optimizer Um, measuring subwoofers should we do measurements prior to the optimizer or is it just good enough where we can just rely on the optimizer itself um, normally i would say just rely on the optimizer the optimizer not only does all of the time domain and amplitude domain correction that that we're that we do but it also sets the levels and delays and all of that stuff just automatically so don't don't feel like you have to do. I know with the AVRs you do all that stuff manually. You don't have to do that with the, the altitude. Just put the microphone out there, orient it carefully, push the go button. It takes measurements and does all that stuff for you. The one exception to that is, you know, every once in a blue moon it doesn't come up very often. Uh, somebody will have subwoofers uh, that are just really loud, and uh, ordinarily we would ask to use the subwoofer direct or SSP input that bypasses the internal crossover and volume controls and things because you know Murphy's law says that you're going to get it perfect and then somebody's going to be vacuuming and they'll bump the knob and the volume will be thrown up. Mm-hmm. Um, however, there are some cases where those direct adjustments, you know, there's no switch for that. And if the subs are so loud that it drives you out of the room during the measurement, I mean, yeah, we can compensate for that. But if it's unpleasant to be in the room during the measurements, you might want to just level the playing field a little bit um, by using the volume control on the subs or you know something like that. Uh, we can also do some of that in the in the altitude if the sub doesn't have those adjustments. Uh, I would just suggest that if anybody runs into a situation like that, this is in the category that I tell all my installers. You know, there are certain things in here that come up so rarely. We have a way of solving the problem, but they come up so rarely, it's just not worth your learning about it. If you run into a problem, call one of us, we'll log into your system based on your description of the problem. You know, we may change one or two little settings and then you can get on with your life. There's no point in you guys learning everything that we have to know because most of it doesn't come up very often. Does the uh, optimizer time align your subwoofers? Yep. So it does all that. And it's just not based on frequency response. No, no. We do level, delay, uh, amplitude response, and time domain uh, correction. So uh, let me see if I can see your, now that I rebooted my machine, let's see if I can connect to your box again. You can't, you, I don't see it. You still can't get in there? Weird. Yeah. Well, we're looking at the uh, optimizer graphs right now. Okay. So uh, if you would, mm-hmm. go to the impulse parenthesis lin for linear uh, tab in the optimizer graphs. Mm-hmm. And you'll probably have to go down to the lower right hand corner, the XY adjustments and, and back up quite a bit. Um, because 
when you're zoomed in appropriately for amplitude response, you're zoomed way too far in for seeing what's going on with the impulse response. Yeah. But if you back it up so that the impulse, you know, transient and subsequent wiggles are, you know, completely visible within uh, the, the little frame. What what I normally do just by way of conveying this, and I'm, I'm sorry, I can't connect to your machine right now, which is weird. Yeah. Um, I just start with the screen channels, left, center, right. Yeah, left, Presumably, they're all the same speak, same brand yeah. model of speaker. Um, and so if you start with left, center, and right, and you're backed up, just so people understand what the uh, test signal looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, if you imagine a, a pistol going off or a rim shot on a snare drum or, you know, some really fast transient out in the middle of a field. So there are no echoes or anything like that. It's just there's a, you know, the signal is going along and at exactly three milliseconds, uh, which is just an arbitrary time stamp. But at three milliseconds, the signal should go vertical, come right back down again, and then nothing. So it's just a tiny little click. Um, of course, when you do that to a speaker, um, you know, speakers mass and suspensions and, um, you know, they'll hopefully move in the right direction and then they'll probably overshoot a little bit and settle down and better speakers will settle down faster and overshoot less. But, um, but they're still mechanical devices. They're, they're not going to respond perfectly. The, in, in theory, a perfect speaker would, you know, all, all of the drivers would jump forward, jump back to their resting position and stop on a dime and just stay there. There'd be nothing else after that. And of course, that's not realistic. What the optimizer does is by way of, because of all of the time domain correction that we're doing, uh, we know what the signal was that we put into the system. We're measuring what's actually coming out of the speaker and into the microphone. And any difference between those two is by definition distortion, right? Um, so we measure the distortion, the difference between the input and the output, and we can then flip the distortion upside down and, if you will, pre-distort the signal to compensate for the distortions that the speaker will subsequently apply to whatever we send it. And that's why the difference between the before and after curves, uh, it's still not going to be perfect because it's a mechanical device, but but typically the, the, the spike is much better defined and you know more coordinated. The, the ringing is less uh, after the initial spike. But where it gets really interesting is, you know, most theaters, you have big speakers behind the screen because that's where you have room. Okay. You have maybe medium-sized speakers for surrounds because you don't have quite so much space. And then you have smaller speakers in the ceiling because that's what fits. Different drivers, different crossover networks, you know, they're, they're going to be different in the time domain. As you start layering in, you know, for example, instead of just the screen channels, maybe all of the listener level speakers. Um, quickly, and I can't see what you're doing, so I'm just saying what I normally see. Um, the before response to that same impulse mm -hmm. starts getting kind of messy. Um, it's sort of like a tangled, much tangled yarn. Um, and then the after is a lot cleaner. And then if you continue to add, uh, say, now all of the upper channels, there's no point in adding the subs because we, we're not doing this kind of work to something that moves as slowly as a subwoofer driver does. Um, but as you layer all those things in, it starts to look a bit like a train wreck, the before curve. Yep. And the after curve is typically tight enough that you can only see the the uppermost layers of colors. You know, depending on how many speakers you are, it could be red, green, blue, yellow, whatever. But, um, you know, the, the, the spike is so tight and so consistent that you can't even see a lot of the colors that are kind of underneath. And what that's telling you is that even though you have a, a variety of dissimilar speakers in the room, probably all from the same company, same brand, but the speakers themselves are different models and, and have their differences. And even though they're in, loaded in different parts of the room and therefore the room is also doing different things to them, um, we can make them, we can force all of those dissimilar speakers in different parts of the room to work together to create a coherent sound field so that when they're all told to do the same thing, by God, they all do pretty darn much the same thing. Um, and I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'd be willing to bet 
you know, in my experience, going back to long before I worked for Trinoff, every time I've heard a Trinoff based system, it didn't matter whose speakers were involved. Um, I mean, some of the systems were tuned better than others, and you know, some people are a little bit better at that now than other people are. But they all had this remarkable coherence of the presentation in, in the spatial sense. Um, you, you couldn't tell where the speakers were. It was just this enveloping sound field. Um, and I, I noticed it back when I was working for a speaker company and um, thought, hmm, we should look into this for demos at trade shows and things like that. Um, because it was it was pretty striking. Um, and I, I think that this time domain correction and the degree to which we are really successful doing it is a big, big piece of that characteristic trait. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can you uh, exp want can you explain the uh, can you explain the filter section here in the graph? Oh, the filter is how we get from before to after. It's like the we we see the before curve. Um, the after curve is based on the target curves that that you told us, you know, this is how we'd like it to behave. Um, and then the filter is the result of all of the really complex computations that we do when you press the compute button. Um, and there's a lot of hairy math that is way beyond my pay grade involved in that. Um, having said that, it works amazingly well. I, something that I can manage it is within my pay grade. One of the reasons the optimizer works differently, and I would argue better, but very differently than other products. Um, if you leave, leave us aside for the moment, and if you look at the world of room correction, aside from Trinol, um, there are certainly some systems that are better than others. I, I suspect you've had experience with that chain. Some, you know, some just work better than others. Mm -hmm. And some will work pretty well, if, you know, especially unless if somebody kind of knows what he's doing. But they all work conceptually kind of the same way. They're, they're measuring the response of the speaker in the room as kind of one big problem to be fixed. And then they have different ways of trying to go about solving that problem. Um, but they're all kind of looking at it as a single problem that needs to be fixed. The optimizer, and this comes out of that early research back in the 2000, 2003 area, um, this optimizer was specifically designed to be quite a bit more specific and surgical than that. Um, it, it recognizes, and this was just the understanding of the, our founders, that you know, day one, there are actually a lot of different problems going on in, in those measurements. There's, you know, let's look at the direct sound directly from the loudspeaker. Um, you know, we've already talked a little bit about the fact that there's a lag between when you put a signal in and when the mass on a spring actually responds and so forth. So the first problem and the first order of business is let's see what we can do to make the speaker a better speaker. Because if the speaker is really bad, it doesn't matter what we do anywhere else. It's going to be really bad. So the first order of business is if we're using active crossovers, we need to calibrate those very accurately. Even if we're not using active crossovers, there are still things we can do to help the direct sound from the speaker. We can help the speaker be a better speaker. Once we're done with that, we look at the first reflections off the sidewall, floor, ceiling, because those, unlike subsequent reverberation that have been bouncing around for a while, those first reflections are somewhat determinative. We can, you can't get rid of them. That's the job of passive room treatment, but we can mitigate them to some degree. So let's do what we can there. Always wanting to be air on the side of under correction rather than over correction. That's a company philosophy. Um, and then we look at subsequent reverberation and standing ways. And you know, there was a list of half a dozen different very specific problems all of which have to do with acoustics, but they're all very different problems. And therefore, each of those problems has a different optimal way of solving it, right? And rather than looking at one big problem and trying to put a big old Band-Aid on it, uh, we dissect all of these related but different problems, figure out the best way of solving each one, and then we combine all of those into the final filter, which goes back to your question. Mm -hmm. So the, the filter that is being shown there is you know how we get from where we started out to where we want to be um the place where i use the filter the most is i mentioned that uh, we would rather under correct than over correct uh, the 
thinking there is that undercorrection is still a step in the right direction. Overcorrection um, can actually call attention to itself and away from the program material, which seems like a bad thing. Uh, and in extreme cases, overcorrection, like maybe too much boost in the EQ, can blow stuff up. So you don't want that. Um, our default settings uh, out of the box are we will allow boosts of no more than six decibels and we'll do cuts of 10 dB. So the optimizer in terms of amplitude response is working within that little window. Um, since taking power out of a speaker is very rarely a problem, right? Um, I usually open that up on the bottom end. If, if there were some really huge uh, standing wave in the room that was causing a 15 dB bump in the bass, I would rather fix that. So I usually take maximum attenuation down to maybe minus 20. But I always wait until after I've done some measurements before I increase the maximum boost, because you really want to know where that's happening. You know, a 10 dB boost, which is 10 times as much power um, at 200 hertz going into a woofer, probably is not going to be a problem for any competently designed speaker. But that 10 dB boost at the very bottom of the tweeter's range at maybe two and a half or three kilohertz will probably blow up a tweeter you know, during a, an action movie when you've got it turned up. Um, so one of the things I look at in the filter is if you look closely, and I don't know if I can see this, but my internet is not cooperating. Um, there are places in the filter where it looks, it's sort of flat topped and it's bumped into that plus six dB wall and, and where we told it, no, you can't go any further than that. So you can look very quickly at the filter and see kind of, okay, so where is it, where is it flat topping? Because those are the areas where if I gave it permission to be more aggressive, that's where it would be more aggressive. Um, and as long as that's not happening, you know, in a place where your speaker is delicate, you know, you can do it. But you want to make those decisions in an, an informed way. You don't want to just open it up and go nuts. Now, even as advanced as the optimizer is, you're not getting rid of room nulls, am I correct? Mm, well, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, some of that can be done in the time domain um, because we are not doing just straight amplitude fixes. Um, but you can never get rid of them entirely. I mean, fundamentally, you're right. Um, we can often improve on them but um, in ways that sometimes is surprising. Um, but no, I would never say that you can completely get rid of them. Yeah. You may move them from one part of the room to another. <clears throat> All right. I, I feel like we'll, we'll get to, uh, we can keep, we, we can keep talking about bass for, for hours. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> is, knows it has been before. <laughs> All right, let's talk about let's talk about the rest of the. Let me bring up the graphs here. I'm gonna bring up. Should I try to reboot this so you can get in here? Um, uh, maybe I. You know, it's possible that it's. I see. I mean. I. All right. Okay, I'm gonna start it back up here. Shows up as well now. I was going to look at it in a different way to see if it showed up online. I did the, uh, I powered it off. I'll turn, I'll, I'll turn it back on. Okay. So we're just looking at the timeline again. So what do we got here? So let's talk about question in the question in the chat here. HDMI 2.1. Is there going to be an upgrade path for that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, uh, starting about two years ago now, uh, we began working with a, new company uh, sp specializes in HDMI, um, largely in anticipation of HDMI 2.1. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we didn't want to be coming at them at the last minute and saying, oh, by the way, us too. So <laughs> we've started a relationship with them. We've been working with them for a couple of years now. Um, and uh, they, you know, work very closely with Panasonic. Panasonic has uh, the most advanced chipset, and Panasonic is already quite a bit further down the road in terms of developing the chipsets that'll be needed for 2.1 uh, than anybody else. Um, some of your viewers may have seen televisions that are announced as HDMI 2.1 yep. um, and other products. More often than well, more often than not, it's a subset of 2.1. Um, 
if you're not doing the full 48 gigabits per second thing, it's not really HDMI 2.1. Right. If you add certain features like enhanced audio return channel, that is part of the HDMI 2.1 specification. But to to say that something that's doing 18 gigabits per second is HDMI 2.1 um, under those circumstances is a bit misleading. Oh, I think you did something. Oh, so we're back. So 2.1 is in the works and it's coming. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to hold my breath for it because yeah. the silicon isn't available yet. Uh, the you know the full 48 gigabits per second silicon. But it's but um, it, so it's going to be a while. So but we the altitude is both the 16 and the 32 are quite modular, particularly yeah. with regard to HDMI because you know, it's just a moving target. Yeah, so basically you're not going to have to buy a brand new unit just to get 2.1. Oh gosh, no. Okay. No. As an example, when we went from HDMI 1.4 to 2.0, um, the the board that allowed us to do that um, was $700 for the upgrade. And you know, the hardest thing about that upgrade was keeping track of all the little tiny screws. <laughs> <laughs> It's because some some of them are pretty small, but um, but yeah, you, you could swap in the board and or you know typically your dealer would do it, but the, the dealer would swap in the board, contact us, we do a quick software update, and you're up and running. Of course, if it's a hardware upgrade, I'm assuming there would be some sort of a fee for that since we're getting some new hardware. Well, sure. Um, software our software updates are always free, and yeah, and that's. Incredibly cool. Yeah. So, so but if there's so, hardware cost, I, I can tell you that there was another company that was selling the same board that we were selling, and they sold it for twenty five hundred dollars. Wow. <laughs> our um, our take on that is, you know that that's not a profit center. That's customer service. You know, people paid a lot of money for an altitude to begin with. It's our job to make sure that that remains a good investment yep. down the road. Yeah. And as far as, you know, I kind of want to keep this for last, but as like we were talking about this earlier as like a value proposition, like why does the altitude cost so much? Um, I feel like that, yes, it's like $17,000. This is for the, this is for the baby version. This is not even the big boy, but uh, we're talking about yeah. usually a main flagship is about $6,000, $5,000. Three years down the road, if you're one of those people that like to upgrade every year, you're talking about fifteen grand already. Here, you drop it once, well, and the upgrade path is maybe. Maybe you just upgrade when there's a major format change of some yeah. sort, but that's still every couple of years. Every couple of years, yeah. But this, this, this people like me, like I like to upgrade like every year. If there's if there's a newer version of a new op, uh, Ankyo or a Marantz or Yamaha, that's like four or five grand every year. And that's basically very minimal yeah. changes in in hardware and if software, if anything, there might be like a new concert hall effect or something like that. But that doesn't really matter though. But if we're talking about the turn of altitude, it's been out. This one has the 16 has been out since 2017. The 32 has been out since 2015, and it's all been end of 2014. Actually. 2014. Yeah. And everything's been upgraded yeah. through software, and it's still kind of king of the hill. All through software upgrades. So if you dropped your money software, back then, software plus HDMI, those are really the two. Uh, HDMI requires hardware changes, right? But but yeah, you're 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 fundamentally right. Um, when HDMI evolves to a whole new, you know, that something that requires new silicon, obviously we have to accommodate the new silicon. Mm -hmm. But because you know, one of the reasons we're more expensive is that we have a very powerful multi-core Intel CPU in there. And doing 64-bit floating point processing and, you know, this entire software ecosystem that we've developed over the last 20 years. Um, and, you know, as I said at the outset, we, that allows us to do quite a number of things that nobody else can do. Um, not merely, uh, you know, not the least of which is keeping up with changes in technology, as you just alluded to. Right. Um, but we've also been able to introduce a lot of very specific uh, technology that nobody else is doing uh, in terms of particularly time domain correction uh, alongside of all of the amplitude domain stuff. And of course, it passes Dolby Vision. That's not a that's, that's not a thing, yeah. right? Okay. I can't. Well, yeah, I can't. Is Dolby Vision certified? 
the next board that we're working on has already, I've already tested it, it passes Dolby Vision. It's, um, I'm not sure if we're actually going to go through the certification process or not. Um, but yeah, I've already tested it. It does that and, you know, all the usual suspects in terms of different flavors of HDR. Yes, it, it passes that Dolby Vision 3D. So you're all good there. I've tried that in my, I've tried that on my TV sets and uh, my. Oh, uh, you're actually doing projector. 3D still. Of course, who doesn't do 3D? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, since we're talking about upgrades, the HDMI 2.1 obviously it's going to be on the horizon at some point in time. IMAX enhanced as well. Yeah, um, IMAX enhanced. As I understand, we're talking to our, our developers. Um, I think we're of the opinion that you know our IMAX enhanced code is, um, is is baked. I mean, it's ready to go, but we haven't. As your listeners probably know, uh, IMAX enhanced is a a variant on DTSX. Um, yeah. It's a twelve point zero version of DTSX, which from DTS is a 30.2 kind of system. Um, so right off the bat, their recommended speaker positions are a little bit different. They're only 12 channels instead of a bunch. Um, and there is no LFE. All 12 of those channels are going to be completely full range, which means um, if you don't have an altitude, um, when you're shopping for an ADR, you know, whatever your next processor is, pay very close attention to what it does in terms of base management because uh, if you want to be able to watch IMAX, IMAX enhanced, the chances of you're having 12, 20 hertz capable speakers in your room are slim and none. Um, you'll, you'll want to have pretty flexible base management to take full advantage of that. Um, we haven't been able to get it certified yet, and we can't release it without certification. That's a contractual obligation. Um, and I think this is now speculation on my part. Uh, but I, I suspect that the reason we haven't been able to get it certified yet is that um, we came out with DTSX Pro, and I think the guys at DTS are working really hard to try and get DTSX Pro out to, you know, the rest of the world. Because um, I'm sure there are other manufacturers who are beating them up about it every day. And out of the box, the the, the altitudes have Oro 3D out of the box. Mm -hmm. So no upgrade path yeah, for that. Sorry there. Yeah, it's always yeah, and the Oro 3D is has always been there since February of 2015, um, and you know when they make little tweaks to their code, it just gets rolled out in our next software release. And no software updates. There's no fee for the software updates. No, no. From our point of view, that's it's a, well. First of all, it's a major competitive advantage from just a purely commercial point of view, but it's also kind of keeping faith with our customers. Right. They, they, the reason they bought this thing was so that they could stop buying surround processors mm -hmm. every couple of years, as you indicated. And and we, you know, from our point of view, if somebody comes out with a new format, mm -hmm. TSX Pro is yep. the most recent. But if somebody comes out with a new format, um, and one of our customers, you know, plays a movie that could take advantage of that format on their on their kaleidoscape, whether it's a PD or just dropping a disc in a player, they should not have to be reading the fine print of you know the back of that disc jacket or whatever, um, so that they can then manually go into their surround processor and tell it what it should be doing. Right. It should just work. Um, and you know, given the rate at which things change, you know, just making it work means you got to update things pretty regularly. Speaking of DTS X Pro. So it's not maxed at 11 channels anymore. Now we're getting 32, yeah. 32 speakers, right? Well, it's 30 main speakers. And for some reason, they have two LFEs. I'm not aware that anyone has actually created a recording that has more than one LFE. Mm -hmm. But but the format can support that, yeah. So let's talk about, since now we're having, now we've got all these extra side channels, overhead channels. Are 4K Blu-rays or whether we're watching on a 4K Blu-ray or if we're streaming it through Vudu or iTunes, are we maxed at 7.1.4? If it is mm -hmm. if it is maxed at that, yeah. well, like what's embedded in that stream? And if it is at 7.1.4, how does the trend of uh, handle the surround information? Is it arraying it or is it uh, discrete? Uh, how is it, how's it handle that? 
again, it's pretty flexible, but we should probably back up. Uh, I, I wrote an article for widescreen review. It was last summer um, on object oriented audio. And if anybody uh, is interested, you can go to widescreen review and download it or contact me and I'll email you the PDF because uh, this is a fairly detailed conversation. Briefly, um, you know, there's a fundamental difference, which uh, I'm amazed at how widely confused even people in the industry are about this. Um, there's channel-based audio. We're all familiar with it going back to mono, stereo, 5.1, 7.1. And mixers are very comfortable with that. They know that, well, I, if I want something to appear halfway between the left channel and the center channel, I kind of feed the same thing into both, and phantom imaging will get me to where I want to go. Object-oriented audio doesn't work that way. Um, the object is just a soundtrack. It's the output of you know, one channel of the mixing board. And it can be any combination of sounds that the sound designer wants. But to keep it simple, let's say it's the sound of a bullet ricocheting. Um, so instead of taking that sound of a bullet ricocheting and moving it from one channel to the next, to the next, to the next, um, panning it through those channels, what you do is you create the sound of the bullet ricocheting. And then you attach metadata to it. And there are, there are only three pieces of metadata. There's location, which obviously changes over time. So, you know, the bullet can move very fast just by changing its location faster frame to frame in the movie. There's location, there's size, and there's another parameter called diffusion, uh, the flip side of which is focus. So to stay with the bullet ricocheting idea, you have this little sound and it's got information associated with it and it's moving very quickly from there right past my ear to behind me and it's this tight little ball of sound size that is also tightly focused um, and so it's this tiny little thing that whizzes past my ear and scares me by comparison you could also have uh, say a crack of lightning and then the thunder that rolls that starts off you know, in this direction, and then it just kind of rolls across the valley that you're sitting in as part of the movie. Um, that thunder is still just one thing. It now can be made very large, so that it'll be rendered into all of the channels as it kind of rolls past you. Um, but it's just that one thing. They're not putting that sound into each and every speaker and duplicating it. It's a sound with the parameter in this case of, you know, certain very, probably relatively slow motion, but it's also growing and getting very big so as to envelop the entire room before it goes on past you. So in a lot of ways, object oriented audio is a lot more efficient rather than having to put the same information in multiple speakers to create the illusion of size or motion or whatever. You just have this, the recorded information once and then some information about what it's doing and how it should do it. Uh, and it's the job of a $400 AV receiver or an Altitude 32 to take that metadata and to, you know, based on its understanding of the available first, to render that sound to the appropriate places. Um, okay, so that's how object-oriented audio is supposed to work. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, Dolby Atmos, as an example, DTS-X is very similar. Um, in Dolby Atmos, the, the basic 7.1 channels that we're accustomed to thinking of as the bed channels, those are actually audio objects. The difference is that uh, for backwards compatibility reason with older AVRs that maybe don't understand Atmos, um, those objects never move. They're positioned where you would expect the 7.1 channels to be. Um, they, they're formatted as objects, but they're backwards compatible with channels. Uh, and then you can have within the bandwidth of, of Blu-ray, you can have 15 or 16 objects total. So you can have quite a, quite a number of things flying around the room. Um, where was I going with that? <laughs> I, I, I distracted myself. Um, oh, I know. Uh, so when we first got I mentioned earlier that one of the advantages of having a software-based platform is that we don't have to live with some of the stupid decisions that some engineer in Texas might make. So some engineer in Texas decided that 7.1.4, that's plenty. Nobody will want to buy more than that. Um, and everybody except for us was stuck with 7.1.4 for a really long time. Um, 
in a similar vein, there are some uh, loops that were sort of pre-rendered to a 7.1.4 kind of layout under the same thinking that, well, you know, this is probably plenty. This will be good enough, right? I mean, how many of these, how many people, how many chains are there out there that are going to have you know, <laughs> more speakers than that? Um, and, you know, Wonder Woman is a famous example. Of it. And Disney in general uh, it has been pretty guilty of this, of just, it's still object-oriented audio, but much like the bed channels, the ceiling objects just never move. They, they you know, you put a couple here, a couple there, and they call it a day. And I guess the advantage from their point of view is that it, it turns it into a channel-like mixing environment, which their sound engineers are already very comfortable with. There are more of them, but it's, it's more of the same thing. Um, fortunately, partly because people like yourself and people like us have been jumping up and down and screaming, um, we are seeing fewer and fewer movies being released that have really bastardized the idea of object-oriented audio. And I'm probably giving both you and me too much credit because the 800-pound gorilla in all of this is Dolby. And, and Dolby has been extremely proactive about uh, beating up the studios and saying, you're leaving so much really cool stuff on the table if you don't use the tools that we invented for you to use. Um, so Netflix is doing a great job. Amazon Prime, uh, some of the streaming platforms uh, are, you know, Netflix has announced publicly that all of their mixing studios are going to be the monitoring systems for the studios are going to be at least 9.1.6. And mm -hmm. you probably know that they also distribute a lot of content that they did, they themselves did not make. And they are telling people who are producing content to be distributed on Netflix that you have to have at least 7.1.4. And we strongly recommend 9.1.6 in your mixing environment or else we're just not interested. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, the good guys, Netflix, Amazon, uh, Apple TV, you know, the Apple TV Plus. Mm -hmm. um, we work fairly closely with a lot of these folks and uh, they get it. Um, it was some of the more traditional old school studios that took a while to catch on. And just for the just for the subscribers out there that are interested, like why do you need 32 channels or why do you need 16 channels? You're, so each channel is not necessarily a channel. Like you can use that for... It is rendered yeah. to a channel. Um, it depends on what you're playing. Um, you know, if you are playing, I don't know, 7.1, just a legacy 7.1 movie from 15 years ago. I mean, you, um, I mean, you can mix... If you're not using... You don't have to use 32 channels. That doesn't mean you have 32 speakers. You can use maybe like... 11 channels and have the other ones for subwoofers and you can cross them over and different, different. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So you're not 32 All channels. Are... doesn't mean 32 speakers. Correct. You can also, uh, the extra speakers, we can go as high as 64. If yeah. You want. <laughs> okay. Story. But, um, but those, they're physical connectors, the physical outputs, right. That um, could be, if you had uh, triamplified screen channels, um, you know, active speakers, that's nine channels right there. LCR times three. Um, and we would take care of the active crossovers to separate the bass from the mid range to the treble. Um, talk very about the bass management system. Talk about. Uh, they're, they're, you can chew up channels in a hurry. Talk about the active crossovers for, the active crossovers for a minute, because I don't think if anybody else does that. Well, I, as I mentioned, our, the, the, we sort of come at this from the pro world. Um, and if you go into any recording studio, or for that matter, any commercial cinema, um, all the speakers are actively crossed over, meaning instead of just sending a full range speaker level signal to the speaker and then having big honking caps and coils and passive components inside the speaker to divide things up to the woofer and the range and the tweeter, in the pro world, um, you know, whether this is done actually in the speaker with integrated DSP and amplifiers or whether it's done outside of the speaker, the idea is you, you divide things up at a line level, at a preamp level, um, and you can do that using DSP, which allows you to do it far more accurately because it eliminates all the parts tolerances and things like that. 
um, you know, mathematically perfect. Um, you can do exactly what you need to do, and and then you have each driver being driven directly by a separate channel of amplification. So the tweeter gets a channel all of its own, the mid-range gets a channel all of its own base. So now let's see what happens when, well, okay, it's, um, I can, well, I'll leave that alone. Um, let's see what happens if, let's say there's a huge base transient of some sort or an explosion. Oh, sorry, did, I change, that? did I change that on you? The, <laughs> hmm? Did I change that on you? No, I, I, I just noticed that you were moving around in the interface that was drafted. Um, going back to active speakers, one of the big advantages of active speakers is that any distortion that happens in one of the drivers can't get to the other drivers. So if you wind up clipping the amplifier, this, first of all, you have three amplifiers, so maybe three times as much power available to the speaker. And then one of those channels is just going to the woofer, for example, if it's a three-way. Um, if you manage to clip the amplifier channel that's going to the woofer, the mid-range and the tweeter drivers are still crystal clear. It doesn't affect intelligibility. It doesn't blow up anything. This is why in, in the pro world, sure, it costs more money to use active crossovers and have all those extra channels of amplification, but it is so worth it because if you're a commercial cinema owner and you have a one of your theaters in a multiplex goes down because you blew a tweeter out or a mid-range and now people can't understand what the actors are saying, that's a huge opportunity cost to have one of your theaters offline for maybe a couple of days while FedEx ships in a replacement driver and you have a tech try to fix it. Um, so they, they just they won't do it. It's, it's worth the money up front to make sure that they can continue to do business down the road. And the same thing for recording studios. Um, it not only performs better objectively, but it's also a lot more reliable. So what are you doing here? So what do we, uh, is there anything you, how, can you get in? How many channels do you have in the system right now? Are you using all 16? Not, apparently not. Uh, no, so let's, I've got 15. 15, okay. So we've got room for one extra. Which would be the VOG, which I'm planning on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I just, we're on left right now. This, for, for your viewers, um, along, these little tiny tabs along the top, your left, right, center, those are the individual speakers. Mm -hmm. and I just grab what we were on we we won't save this so we won't mess up your your setup but you know if you imagine an active two-way crossover um it might be so, so there are low pass and high pass filters a high pass filter for a woofer is often thought of as an infrasonic or subsonic filter and if you want to make sure that nothing below 20 hertz gets into your woofer because it'll just be flopping around um so we can add that so let's say for the sake of argument uh we'll make this 20 hertz and we'll say you know what i'm really concerned about it. let's say i have a ported loudspeaker so below the tuning frequency of the port if, if any information gets into that speaker it's the, the woofer is just going to flop around it's not going to make any sound um so wow because i overdid that didn't I? oh the combination it's because they're yeah, okay, I, I need to finish filling this in. And so let's say the subwoofer, uh, excuse me, the woofer gets up to, I don't know, 2,500 hertz. And it's just a two-way. And we're talking about, this is just the left speaker. There's still, depending on how many speakers you have in your system, there's an insane amount of flexibility within the software. Yeah, let me finish filling in something that will make more sense once you see it. Um, or... And then we'll leave that at none. So the idea here is that you can see low green, right? The low woofer, the you know that I I said let it go from 20 hertz to 2500 hertz, and so the it you know goes from it's minus uh, 6 dB down at 20 because that's the characteristic the filter that I chose, and then it's nice and flat electrically, and then it rolls off you know at two and a half kilohertz. And that's where the red high pass or you know tweeter comes in and then it just goes on out to beyond 20k the blue line is the electrical sum of the red and the green so one of the nice things about Linkwitz riley lr4 filter and crossovers is that they sum to a perfectly flat response electrically um, as you can 
see here, we support a lot of different filter technologies. Again, this is not something that you should be thinking about. This is for the speaker designer. If you buy a speaker that's capable of being biamped or triamped or whatever, you would just plug in the, the characteristics and the numbers that the speaker designer tells you to plug in. You don't have to really understand what's going on. You just have to be able to copy the numbers down. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I just, I just change something without the need to. But anyway, um, so we should probably like to you know, getting rid of that and doing no filters so that you don't we don't accidentally mess up your system. But you can see here as I change things. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what I did. <laughs> so these buttons up here are hardly ever used. Um, if you have a compression driver, certain specific types of horn-based loudspeakers, um, those horns actually, because of the nature of the beast, they roll off at one of two different frequent uh, rates. And so with this kind of horn, we can introduce an offsetting boost to compensate for the natural roll off of that horn. Uh, or we can do this one, which is a little bit steeper. Or we can go back to normal speakers, which don't need any of that. So again, uh, this comes out of the pro world. We're in the commercial cinema business, the pro business. Um, and that's more commonly those, those features are used there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is one of the reasons for a 32. Um, the other reason, which we didn't touch on, people often ask me, you know, how many speakers do I really need? And and the, the best response, oh, I just leaned back, I forgot that I'm still on camera. Uh, how many speakers do I really need? The answer really depends more on not only the size of your room, but the size and, and shape of the listening area relative to the room. So. We wrote an entire 80 plus page book on the subject of, you know, speaker placement recommendations for multi listener, multi format uh, systems. And, uh, but the, there are only a couple of epiphanies in that whole thing. And then it's a matter of kind of grinding through all the implications. But a couple of the epiphanies are, you know, most people can, un can intuit that if you have a much bigger room, you probably need more speakers, right? That's not hard to imagine. What most people don't stop to think about, but which is probably even more true for any given sized room, as the listening app takes up a bigger and bigger portion of the available space, you also need more speakers. And here's the reason why. Um, if you're the fortunate fellow in the main listening position and everything is balanced and tuned correctly, you know, I mean, the optimizer will do that opt you know, automatically for you. It works really well. And everything sounds great. Even you know with a 7.1.4, 9.1.6, it, it, it'll work really well. But what if you, you know, have a medium-sized room, and as is often the case, you squeeze in just as many chairs as will physically fit, because you want to be able to have a lot of your friends over. Um, one of your friends is that poor guy who's sitting immediately next to the left surround speaker. Right, he's way over on the left edge of the seating area, and that speaker is only like. A foot and a half off of, off of his shoulder, two feet off of his shoulder. Um, for him, again, object-oriented audio. Let's say there is a, a sound that starts off on the screen and goes across the screen, moves out of the left speaker toward the left wide, and then the left surround, and then the left rear surround. Um, for that guy who's sitting in the bad seat, it, he's going to hear it in the left surround speaker before anybody else does because he's so close to the speaker and it's just louder. And then he's going to hear it longer than anybody else does for the same reason. So the perceived motion of that sound, which is supposed to be moving slowly, smoothly down the wall, it's going to jump into the speaker that's right next to him and it's going to stay there and it's going to be too loud while it's there um, until it's pretty much completely gone out of that speaker and moved on to the left rear surround not at all the same experience that the guy in the, the good seat has. The only way to solve that when you're that asymmetric in terms of being equidistant or not um, is to have more speakers down the side of the room 
so that you're anchoring the sound at various points and you're not counting quite so much on phantom imaging. So say you have a higher channel count, same situation, the sound goes from the left speaker to the left wide, and I'll use Dolby nomenclature, to something called the L, uh, LS1, which is a surround channel that's a little bit in front of the main listening area, or main listener spot, then into LS, and then LS2, and then LRS1, LRS, LRS2. You've got a bunch of speakers down this wall. And for the guy sitting in the bad seat, he hears exactly what everybody else hears. It goes from here to there to there, and then it's, it's right next to him, but only for a little while before it moves on to the one behind him. So during that little period of time, yeah, it's a little bit too loud and perceived as maybe a little bit too big, but it's there and then it moves right on. Um, and so everybody in the listening area has a much more consistent, uniform experience of whatever the movie is. Um, that's where the extra channels come in. If you, if you had six chairs in a relatively small room, you probably need a bunch of speakers to make sure that everybody has the same experience. Mm -hmm. If you had the same six chairs in a high school gymnasium, you'd still be in a high school gymnasium and it would sound awful. But mm -hmm. in terms of the perception of the sound moving around, it would probably work pretty well. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. So... So people ask, you know, why do I need all these speakers? Part of it is to make sure everybody has the same subjective experience. Mm -hmm. Part of it can also be to accommodate uh, differences between speaker placement recommendations for Dolby versus DTSX versus Oro. A lot of that actually overlaps fairly conveniently, but not all of it. Your Voice of God channel is an example. Um, that the directly overhead speaker is used by both DTSX and Oro, but Dolby Dolby doesn't have anything like that. All right, now I know we spoke about this really briefly the other day. For the folks that rely on different brands of speakers and they rely on the optimizers or room corrections to make their speakers sound identical, is that a viable option? Should you really go for timbre match speakers for speakers from the same manufacturers? Or can I get a pair of Klipsch and a pair of Martin Logans? And is your optimizer going to make them sound the same? Well, the optimizer won't do anything about uh, wildly disparate radiation patterns. You know, the, the directivity of the speaker is pretty much what it is. Um, in general, um, the optimizer will make the best of disparate situations to a much greater degree than anything else I've experienced. But that doesn't mean that you should give it a harder job than is really necessary. Um, you know, it, whether they are from the brand or very similarly uh, balanced in terms of overall tonal balance, um, it's probably a good idea to at least start off with something that doesn't totally suck. I mean, <laughs> yeah. in terms of room acoustics, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, the optimizer can do really cool stuff, but it is not a replacement for passive room treatment. You know, if, if you give me a high school gymnasium, I'll give you a really good sounding high school gym, but you'll still be able to tell it's a gym. Right, because the the sound will be bouncing around for a really long period of time. There's no active system that can fix that. Um, so you really you need to have both. Um, and and in my mind, um, the first thing you should worry about. Most people would probably say speakers, but I would suggest maybe room acoustics, passive treatment, um, and then speakers. You can argue either one of those before the other, but they're pretty close. And if you if you deal with those two things and then layer in the, the digital acoustics that, that we do, you'll, you'll have a fabulous result. Um, but I wouldn't count on any electronic system to make up for bad system design. Yeah. So room correction is not a crutch to, to fix major problems. Oh, absolutely. Or just problems. Yeah. It's a huge, hugely powerful tool, but not an excuse for doing a bad job in the first place. So what do we have to look forward to in the future of Trinov right now? As far as these altitude models are, are concerned, any any major firmware upgrades or besides 2.1 as a hardware upgrade? Is there anything else? Well, yeah, that's that'll come when it comes, and it'll probably be next year sometime. I don't know. Um, in terms of uh, software updates, we have a few things. We, we don't generally announce features before we're ready to release them. Um, there's one that I may get into trouble for mentioning, but what the heck. Um, 
one of our engineers, um, well, I should back up. I mentioned earlier that Dolby has been leaning really hard on sound engineers and sound designers to take it full advantage of the tools that Dolby has developed for doing object oriented mixes. And if you, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I recommend everybody go to uh, YouTube once they're done with your channel, Shane, mm -hmm. uh, but do a quick search for Ford versus Ferrari. Uh, and there's a 10 or 11 minute little mini documentary uh, of a couple of the, the sound engineers, the sound designer, and uh, I forget their titles, but two guys that worked on Ford versus Ferrari, the soundtrack thereof. And they, they just explain basically what each one is responsible for doing, and they kind of show you you know, some of their artistic decisions and why they did what they did. And if you haven't seen the movie, you should watch it. It's fabulous. But that in that little 10 or 11 minute clip, which is really helpful in understanding why people think that some movies are so much better than others. Um, there are a few places where you can see the little object visualizer that is part of the Dolby software. And so you can see uh, much like, well, let me see if I still have control of your system or not. Well, maybe not. It looks like the connection's gone dead. Anyway, if you go back to the uh, the 3D view, the where you declare the speakers. Oh, okay. It's just really slow. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Okay. It's working. So if you imagine a room like this, where you know the listener level speakers are in green and the the upper speakers are in red, and in this case the subs are brown. Um, and now imagine that there are little yellow dots. And you can you know position it different perspectives so you can kind of see more clearly what's going on and each yellow dot is a sound object if you watch something like gravity which i think was the second atmos movie ever released mm -hmm. it, there are sound objects flying all over the place like uh, you know when they get hit with the russian debris in and then during re-entry and during all the, the action-packed areas you can you can see these yellow objects flying around the room. You can also see them being rendered in real time to the speakers because as one of the yellow objects flies near a speaker, that speaker glows more brightly, right? In this kind of conceptual, you know, visual aid view. Um, and it's on the other hand, if you were to watch Wonder Woman, you would see that the objects just basically are sitting where the speakers are and not really moving very much. Um, so. Christophe, one of one of our engineers, decided on, on his own, just like one weekend, it's like, you know, we because we have the original golden code from Goldie, and because we are implementers of all this, we have access to all that information. I wonder if I could reinvent that you know, visualization tool that they use on the pro side, you know, in the studios where they're making this stuff. And over the weekend, he cobbled something together just kind of for his own amusement. And he showed it to the rest of us, and we we're all like, "Oh my God, that is so cool! We have to have that." And you know, time goes by. Uh, that visualization tool will be part of what I believe is going to be the next release of uh, the Altitude System software. It'll be in both the the Altitude 16 and the 32. And if you've ever wondered what object-oriented audio is all about and how it really works this visualization tool will teach you more than I could possibly tell you about. Um, it's, and it also goes to show, you know, if you were to build a bigger, uh, channel count, let's say, you know, 27 channels instead of, uh, 15 channels or something like that, you can see how it's lighting up and taking advantage of those extra speakers, uh, as the objects move around the room. So that's kind of cool. Yeah really change anything but it's heck of an education now before we wrap this up for the audio files the two channel audio files out there how does uh Trinell fit into that space and is it more home theater centric or can the two channel audio file people out there be confident in purchasing this as a dual home theater stash slash stereo channel setup uh, we we do quite a few of those. As a matter of fact, we sell not a huge number, but because there aren't a lot of speakers of this type. But for for example, at uh, the Munich high end show in it was twenty sixteen, um, company Vivid Audio uh, was introducing their flagship G one S Spirit loudspeakers, and it's a, a four way design and it's capable of either being driven actively or passively. 
And so we had an eight channel altitude 32 there. Um, and we did all the active crossovers in the altitude and we were playing stereo. Well, actually, we we're doing a little bit of that it was an L a 16 channel. But as far as the left and right speakers were concerned, we're using eight channels to power eight channels of, of amplification, feeding the eight drivers in the speakers. Uh, and it sounded fabulous. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Um, we do come from the pro world, right? So recording studios, recording engineers are pretty picky. Um, so if they don't believe that something helps, then you know it doesn't happen. You can, if you like, you, there's another. You can go to the Trinov uh, YouTube channel. Just type in Trinov and do a search, and you'll see uh, a bunch of interviews and testimonials, mostly from pro people. Um, about how it's changed their workflow and, and changed the, the quality of the work that they can do. You can have that same kind of capability in the home if you want to have a sort of a dual purpose home theater and stereo system. I think that's great. Uh, if you have never listened to uh, just your, your favorite CDs in the Oro 3D up mixer, it's called Oromatic, you really should try it. It's, it's awesome. Um, or just plain old stereo, but taking advantage of everything the optimizer does. Um, if you have more of a music only room that is just plain stereo, uh, we also have products for that. Um, there's a product called the Amethyst, which is a high end two channel preamp streamer, active crossover, has the optimizer, everything built in. Um, and then there's another product called the ST2 Hi Fi, which is basically a speaker processor, it has the optimizer and the two way active crossover. Uh, that can be added to an existing high-end stereo system. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I have a stereo system in my. It's a two point one system, but my living room is a stereo system, and it's got an altitude in it. Hmm. Um, All right, so it sounds like it's a reliable audiophile esque hi-fi system. But all right, well, I would go further if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll just throw one extra thing in yeah. here. Um, I, I don't often do this because it's not really my style, but on a couple of occasions I've been sufficiently provoked um, to sort of throw down the gauntlet and uh, talking to you know, high-end two-channel dealers uh, saying, okay, give me your best streaming device combined with your best D-Day converter and your best preamp and whatever cables you want to use to connect those things together. And I really don't care how much all of that costs. <laughs> Just give me the best that you sell. And I will put my $10,000 amethyst up against it because the amethyst has both uh, UPnP DLMA if you're more of a J River kind of guy, and it's a rune ready endpoint. So rune is just automatic. Um, we have the active crossover, we have both analog and digital inputs. It's a high quality DAC, and it has the optimizer. And, and that's the game changer because I've done comparisons with $30,000 worth of stuff uh, and beat it. And it's because the optimizer it's just not a fair comparison is there some sort of a new remote control you guys are uh, announcing or releasing it's really aimed more at our pro market but okay. yeah it's it's called la remote our french company um and it's something that our pro customers have been asking for for a long time um they they want a a convenient control interface that can sit right next to their mouse and uh, allow them to quickly switch between whatever functions of some of our pro gear that um, that they want to switch between, I haven't actually played with one yet, and I don't know. Uh, I, I know it's compatible with things like the altitude. I just don't know how practical or useful it's going to be. Right. Well, all right. I think that's. I think we're going to wrap it up here, John. We're coming in just okay. under two hours. But thanks, John, for for joining the podcast today. Um, is there for your stamina? <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot. <laughs> but thanks a lot, a lot of valuable information uh, that I think a lot of prospective, uh, you know, train of buyers are going to be really interested in. A lot of questions you answered for me personally, and I'm sure a lot of people in the uh, the comment section as well. Uh, so, what where can where can they find you? Can can people contact you directly? Or yeah, uh, the the by far the most reliable way is just email. Um, mm -hmm. It's John J O N O H because it's short for Jonathan. J O N dot Heron, H E R R O N, at Trinov.com. Also, guys, be sure on the lookout. You guys are opening a, a big headquarters over here in Connecticut. Am I correct on that? 
Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it as big, but but yes, it's uh, here in Connecticut. Uh, yeah. We have a technology center, which is office and warehouse and training facility, demonstration facility. Um, we'll be doing a little bit of you know research there as well. Um, building a you know a really nice six seat theater. It's going to be eleven by five by eight, um, and it'll be available for. You know, I, I'm, one of the main reasons is so I can do training with my dealers. Mm -hmm. um, but if a, one of my dealers has someone who's never heard a system like that and is thinking about buying one, I, you know, we're available. Um, you know, a lot of my dealers don't have quite as elaborate a system as that. So it's it's a resource. We also have a similar demo system that's actually 11.4.8 uh, out on the West Coast. Um, so we've got a couple of good footholds here. Oh, and there's also, I've forgotten the channel configuration, uh, but the Cedia headquarters uh, in just outside of Indianapolis um, is also an Altitude 33 based system. So, for what it's worth. Best of the best. All right, John. Well, thanks, guys, for checking out the, the live stream here today. If you guys want to listen to the audio portion of this, then I will leave links down in the video's description. So be sure to subscribe to that. You can listen to the podcast on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, your favorite podcasting service. As always, guys, uh, leave questions down below. We can work this in into the video review that's coming up very soon, hopefully. And uh, we'll see you guys again in the next video.